And good evening. Welcome to day four of the 100 Days of Shakespeare event. Uh, my name is Paul Adams. I am with Small Crown Productions and uh, very, very pleased to uh, join you again tonight to talk Shakespeare. So this is a 100 Days event uh, looking at Shakespeare, his life, his works and the period. And it was started by uh, Carolina Furman, part of the Society for Creative Anachronism. So I'm very pleased to take part in that. Um, there is a web link to the Facebook group in the description if you would like to jump in there and take part yourself. Uh, essentially, it's a pretty casual approach to exploring Shakespeare, his works, his life, his times, and just sharing information and knowledge with each other to better our understanding of the work of the Bard. So um, I have set out to attempt uh, as many days as I can to um, do something, whether it's digging a little deeper into some research or just reciting a sonnet, looking at some monologues, looking at some plays. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be on as many nights out of the 100 as possible over the next couple of months. And so tonight is day four, so it's great to have you here. And what I thought I would do tonight is just cover off a little bit about the resources that Shakespeare used. So we as writers today use period scripts and period um, writings to be inspired by, you know. I mean, we see movies um, written based on the plays of Shakespeare. Um, Ten Things I Hate About You is a great example um, based on Taming of the Shrew. So, you know, we see lots of plays, not just from Shakespeare's work, obviously, but a lot of the classic playwrights become inspiration for the work of contemporary players and playwrights. Shakespeare was no different. He would write with resources that were, you know, historic and current to his time. So not only did he take inspiration from other playwrights, he took inspiration from historical stories. He took inspiration and information from other um, historic writings and we're going to touch on five of those this evening very briefly again just a very general overview and a bit of a look at five of them and um, this is by no means an exhaustive list there is some extremely smart people out there who have a much deeper love of research than I who have compiled lists of all of his resources um, for each of the plays and the works that he did. And you can find those online. If you do a little bit of searching online, you'll find those. And uh, for a lot of the works, you will be able to find versions of them on the internet somewhere. Um, Gutenberg uh, is an excellent place to start. If you're not familiar with that, that is a website that houses a lot of out of copyright um, public domain texts. So everything from... Uh, you know, Shakespeare's plays right through to, uh, well, basically anything you can think of that's out of um, formal copyright uh, that's in the public domain probably exists in Gutenberg.org. So I definitely encourage you to check that website out if you've not done that before. And you may be able to find some of these texts here. So let's jump in to this. We can pull that up. Transition over to there. Is that going to come up? Yes, excellent. Good news indeed. So we are going to spend a little bit of time just looking very briefly at a few of the resources that Shakespeare is accredited to having been used. So let's get this stuff out of my way. Um, so let's jump into the first one. Oh, sorry, let's start actually here. The sources come from a couple of places that I've pulled them from. Uh, the first is the Narrative and Dramatic Sources of Shakespeare by Geoffrey Bulloch. Bulloch um, forgive my pronunciation. Um, that is a uh, very out of print book. So um, again, you may be able to find a version of it on Gutenberg. I didn't think to look for that today, actually. Um, but uh, the other place is as I mentioned the other night, in the forewords and the um, the pre-writings to the plays across the complete works, um, I've got the Oxford and the Alexander editions. Um, so, you know, some of these have been sort of mentioned in those uh, books as uh, some of the references that we can be attributing to Shakespeare's writing. So let's look at number one. 
The first one is Plutarch. Now, Plutarch was a Greek philosopher. Uh, he was a historian, a biographer, born around uh, 46 AD, lived to about 119 AD, so it was about 70, 73 when he died. Um, his work was The Lives of the Noble Grecians and Romans, as translated by Sir Thomas North. And so this was accredited to have been a resource that a lot of playwrights used, um, specifically Shakespeare. Um, this book contains stories, lives, and anecdotes of very, very prominent figures through the history of Rome and Greece and uh, is accredited to Plutarch. Um, this book is believed to have uh, appeared, well, references from this book, uh, this writing appear to have been accredited to have appeared, try that again, in uh, All's Well That Ends Well, The Comedy of Errors, and of course, Time of Athens and Julius Caesar, uh, as you can imagine, being a, a historic book about Romans and Greeks. Um, one reviewer of this book said, and I'll read this, what a wonderful read. Plutarch's lives show us how human nature didn't change a bit since antiquity. How human goals, flaws and greatness have been really the same as always. And I think that's a really interesting statement to hear in relation to a book written so long ago when that person compared it to our lives today, not just Shakespeare's use of it. Um, and when we went back into episode one of talking around all of this, and if you missed that and you're only joining here for the first time, um, there is a playlist that you can link up. And uh, I've, I'm dropping all of these videos into a playlist so you can go back and look through them all. But the very first episode, we, we talked around that question of is Shakespeare still relevant? And, you know, the big point that I was hoping to make out of that was absolutely because he is so, so good at writing about human lives. And this review of Plutarch's work just reinforces that concept. So uh, number one, Plutarch, uh, check him out. Number two, Plautus. So again, a Roman dramatist, a comedic playwright. So Plautus was born in 254 BC, lived to about 184 BC. His work is said to only survive in corrupted versions. So, um, you know, writings of rewritings, that sort of thing. So we don't have an original text uh, from the research that I did. Um, and just a little phrase for you here from Britannia.com. Uh, it says, the plots of Plautus's plays, ooh, a lot of plosive alliteration there, the plots of Plautus's plays are sometimes well-organized and interestingly developed, but more often they simply provide a frame for scenes of pure farce, relying heavily on intrigue, mistaken identity, and similar devices. So, that to me is an excellent kind of summary when you look at the fact that this writing and the, the works of Plautus uh, were accredited to being uh, referenced in Shakespeare's Comedy of Errors. And if you know that play, uh, you will see exactly why when he's talking about missed identities and uh, was it mistaken identity and similar devices relying on intrigue, um, Comedy of Errors uh, is all about mistaken identity. Great play. First play I ever produced uh, in full. So fantastic play. Have a very soft spot in my heart for that. So that was the work of Plautus. So um, I'm actually going to go back and find some of his plays because I hadn't realized that he was um, quite the farcical writer. So I'm very, very keen to go back and actually have a look at some of his plays myself. So I'll, uh, I'll let you know how that goes. Number three. Nope. Here we go. There it is. Ovid. Now, Ovid is famous for writing metamorphoses. So another Roman poet, Ovid was born uh, around March uh, in 43 BC. Uh, metamorphoses, if you if you haven't read it, um, I haven't I've I've read bits of it. I haven't read the whole thing in full. Um, it was explained in one explanation online as being an epic that starts with the story of primal chaos, a messy lump of discordant atoms, 
and shapeless prototypes of land, sea, and air. This unruly form floated about in nothingness until some unnamed being disentangled it. So uh, metamorphosis uh, is is a, a absolutely probably one of the most well known um, documented um, references that of Shakespeare's use. Um, uh, references are said to have been found in The Merry Wives of Windsor, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, The Tempest, Troilus and Cressida, Venus and Adonis. Now, Ovid has been described, and this is according to um, interestingliterature.com. So I'm just going to read this because I think this is a really great summary of where, ta- uh, where Ovid sits in the mindset of the literature world. So um, interestingliterature.com say this. Ovid has been described as the originator of the dramatic monologue form. Nearly 2,000 years before Tennyson and Browning developed the dramatic monologue in the mid-19th century, Ovid was in fact doing something strikingly similar and for his time very innovative by writing in the voice of numerous heroines from legend in his work The Herodes, Her- Hero, Heroides. Hero- hmm, yes, yes, I'll, um, I'll drop that name in the description below. I really should work a lot more on my pronunciations. Um, But yeah, for someone uh, of that period to be writing from the viewpoint of uh, female heroes, uh, really important to note that, you know, this idea of feminine heroes isn't new. It was just seems to have been lost over time. And that period where, you know, we're looking at the Elizabethan period, women couldn't even appear on stage uh, to you know, have a a classic playwright um, actually writing from the viewpoints of heroines uh, was either something that was quite common or he was just an absolute, absolute standout for what he was doing. So fascinating. Anyway, Ovid Metamorphoses. The fourth one, Geoffrey Chaucer and the Canterbury Tales. Now, I will say, I was very surprised to discover that this did not influence more of the plays. I expected this to be something that influenced quite a bit more of his work, but the references that I found, it wasn't as many as I thought, and I'll get to which ones they are in a moment. So um, the Canterbury Tales were written between uh, 1387 and 1400, and essentially they're a tale of uh, a group of pilgrims who go on a pilgrimage together, and to help pass the time, they have a storytelling competition while they're walking their pilgrimage. Now, this is a really great structure that Chaucer has used here because it meant that he was able to bring in stories from places other than England. So he was able to bring a group of pilgrims together from different parts of the world and actually voice stories in other um, in, through the eyes of foreigners, essentially. So you get this great, great range of stories through there. Um, where is it? There is a number there, I'm sure I wrote it down. No, I didn't. Uh, I think there's about, I think he was setting out to make a, a, a pilgrimage contest of 30 stories. I think he wrote 24 of them. Um, and there was supposedly uh, the return journey as well that was supposed to be written but never got written. So um, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, uh, if you've ever seen A Knight's Tale, mm, A Knight's Tale, um, yes, cringe all you like, I don't care, I don't care. Uh, I love that film. Um, uh, wonderfully played in that film. And uh, uh, the only reference to Shakespeare's plays that it is accredited to is Midsummer Night's Dream and to The Two Noble Kinsmen, which is actually a Jacobean tragic comedy, um, co-written with John Fletcher, um, is, is they believe that he wrote it with John Fletcher. So, yeah, I expected uh, Chaucer to turn up a little bit more than that. But there you go. The experts have spoken. Uh, and the final one this evening, burning through pretty quick, I didn't want this to drag on too far tonight, um, is probably one of the most referenced um, chronicles in um, Shakespeare's work. And not just Shakespeare, this was referenced by a number of playwrights, particularly around that era. Um, and it's Holland Sheds, Holland's Heads Chronicles by Raphael Holland's Head. So it's a large collaborative work describing England, Scotland, Ireland, and their histories from the first inhabitation to the mid-16th century. 
So the work was a principal source for many literary writers, um, including Marlowe, Spencer, Daniel, and Shakespeare. So it is probably one of the most heavily used uh, references, reference writings in Shakespeare's work. And uh, one of the, uh, the works that it covers, uh, Cymbeline, uh, all the, the histories, of course, Henry IV, part one and two, Henry V, Henry VI, part one and two, King John and Macbeth. So there you go. Five quick resources that Shakespeare used to write his plays. There are lots, lots more. So uh, if you know others or there are others that you know of that you really, really like, pop it in the comments below. Share that information with us. We'd love to hear more about it. Head over to the Facebook group where you can join in and share your information there. That would be fantastic as well. The Facebook group is linked in the description below. While you're here, if you're getting any value out of these uh, little videos, please give them a like, subscribe to the channel, let me know that this is something you're interested in seeing more of. And of course, uh, if you're interested in seeing a little bit more, uh, you can tap the screen here somewhere, there will be a link to the playlist and of course one of the other videos in the playlist. So that's it, day four, done and dusted. Thanks so much for uh, sticking around. Uh, and I will see you. Uh, just transition out of this. There we go. Uh, thanks very much. And I will see you on the next one.